From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! I called the 911 three times to come and help my brother that he's mentally perturbed and he needed help. And I thought it would sound somebody to help him and get some crisis communication going on. I did not call the police officer to come and kill my brother. <laughs> Protests continue near San Diego over the fatal police shooting of an unarmed Ugandan refugee. Police shot and killed Alfred Olango after a sister called 911 to report her brother having a mental health emergency. We'll go to San Diego for the latest and look at a shocking study that shows people with mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians. Then to Syria. Imagine a slaughterhouse. This is worse. Even a slaughterhouse is more human. Hospitals, clinics, ambulances, and medical staff in Aleppo are under attack around the clock. As the Russian-backed air assault on Aleppo continues with the bombing of two more hospitals, the Obama administration is threatening to cut off talks with Moscow. Will the U.S. escalate its military involvement? We'll get the latest. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Protests continued Wednesday in San Diego, California, suburb of El Cajon, where police shot and killed an unarmed African-American man Tuesday, after a sister called 911 to report her brother was having a mental health emergency. Eyewitnesses in El Cajon said Alfred Olango was holding his hands up when he was tased by one of the police officers and then fired upon by five times by another officer. Police initially said they fired when Olango pulled out an object. On Wednesday, the police admitted the object was, in fact, an e-cigarette. This is protester Asak Ali. It's not just about how I'm feeling about it. It is how, how America feel about it, because police are terrorizing America, each and every state. They're killing people each and every corner. It, this is a time for America to look at into it. This is not ISIS in the Middle East. We have one here. Police are a terrorist, killing people more than ISIS. That's what we need to look at it, really careful. This comes as questions are being raised about the El Cajon police officer, Richard Gonsalves, one of the officers involved in a Longo shooting. Last year, Gonsalves was sued for sexual harassment after making lewd propositions and texting explicit photos to his subordinate officer. He was demoted to officer from sergeant. Gonsalves was just served with a second suit in August of this year after the harassment continued. We'll go to San Diego and speak with his, the plaintiff's attorney, after headlines. Meanwhile, in Louisiana, a judge has released body camera video showing police officers shooting into a car and killing a six-year-old child, September 2015. The boy, Jeremy Martis, was in first grade. He was killed on sight after being hit by five bullets. Authorities say the marshals began chasing the car after seeing an argument between a man and a woman. When the car chase ended at a dead-end street, the marshals approached the car and opened fire. The video shows the driver, Christopher Few, with his hands in the air in his car. The Louisiana State Police Superintendent said the video is, quote, the most disturbing thing I've seen, unquote. Two U.S. Marshals involved in the shooting are on trial facing second-degree murder charges. In Washington, D.C., Congress has voted overwhelmingly to allow Americans to sue Saudi Arabia over the 9-11 attacks, overriding President Obama's veto of the bill. It's the first time during Obama's presidency his veto has been overridden by Congress. The Senate rejected the veto 97 to 1, while the House rejected it 348 to 77. This means the, quote, Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act now becomes law. This legislation would allow courts to waive claim of sovereign, foreign sovereign immunity after an act of terrorism occurs within U.S. borders. This is President Obama in a CNN town hall Wednesday night. If we eliminate this notion of sovereign immunity, then our men and women in uniform around the world could potentially start seeing ourselves subject to reciprocal laws. And the concern that I've had is, has nothing to do with Saudi Arabia, per se, or my sympathy for 9-11 families. It has to do with me not wanting a situation in which 
uh, we're suddenly exposed to liabilities for all the work that we're doing all around the world. The bill had passed both the House and the Senate earlier this year, but President Obama had vetoed it earlier this month. In July, the Obama administration declassified 28 pages from the September 11th report detailing possible ties between the Saudi government and the 9-11 attacks. The declassified documents raise new questions about the role of a Saudi consular official based in the Los Angeles area. He personally helped two of the hijackers after they arrived in Los Angeles in early 2000. Fifteen of the 19 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. In news from the campaign trail, a new investigation by Newsweek reveals that one of Donald Trump's businesses violated the U.S. embargo on Cuba and secretly did business there in the late 1990s. The investigation draws on internal company documents showing Trump's company, then called Trump Hotels and Casino Resorts, spent at least $68,000 in Cuba during a secret business trip to Havana. At the time, it was illegal under U.S. law to spend any corporate money in Cuba. The investigation also reveals Trump had knowledge of top executives working to cover up the illegal expenditures. Only one year later, Trump wrote in an op-ed piece in the Miami Herald in 1999, quote, I would rather take a financial hit than become a financial backer of one of the world's most brutal dictators. Of course, we should keep the embargo in place, he wrote. Meanwhile, Forbes magazine is reporting that Donald Trump has lost at least $800 million in personal wealth since 2015. Forbes estimates Trump's net worth is now about $3.7 billion. In more news from the campaign trail, Libertarian presidential nominee Gary Johnson stumbled during a town hall interview on MSNBC Wednesday night when host Chris Matthews asked him to name his favorite foreign leader. Johnson couldn't name a single one. Instead, he said he was having an Aleppo moment, referring to an earlier interview when he was asked about what he would do to stop the devastating bombing against the major Syrian city, and he responded by asking, what is Aleppo? This is former New Mexico governor and presidential candidate today, Johnson. Who's your favorite foreign leader? Who's my favorite? Any, just name anywhere in the country, any one of the continents, any country. Name one foreign leader that you respect and look up to. Anybody. Mine was Shimon Peres. No, no, okay, I'm talking about living. Go ahead. <laughs> you got to do this anywhere, any continent. Canada, Mexico, Europe, over there, uh, Asia, South America, Africa, name a foreign leader that you respect. I guess I'm having an Aleppo moment in the former, former president of Mexico. But I'm giving Mexico. you the whole I world. Know, I know, I know. Anybody I know. in the world you like. Anybody. Pick any leader. The former president no. of Mexico. Which one? I'm, I'm having a brain. I'm well, name a brain anybody. Fight. In New York, authorities say they've identified the two men who found a bag containing an unexploded bomb placed on 27th Street in Chelsea earlier this month during the bombings in New York and New Jersey. Authorities say video shows the two men taking the items out of the bag, then walking off with the bag itself. Police describe the bag's contents as a pressure cooker bomb connected to a flip phone packed with shrapnel and wired to detonate. Authorities say the two men have now been identified as Egyptians who are visiting New York and have since returned. Authorities do not think the men have anything to do with the bombings. This comes as the main suspect in the bombings, Ahmad Khan Rahami, has retained the American Civil Liberties Union to represent him, after judges in both New York and New Jersey rejected efforts by public defenders seeking to represent Rahami. The head of the ACLU in New Jersey, Udi Ofer, said the judge's move, quote, violates the Constitution and needlessly sacrifices civil liberties in the name of national security, unquote. In more political news, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is again under fire over the George Washington bridge lane closures. Prosecutors say Christie's top aides conspired to create a traffic jam to punish the mayor of Fort Lee for failing to endorse Christie's reelection in 2013. Now, a former Port Authority official and former ally to Christie, David Wildstein, has testified in federal court that Christie knew all about the plan ahead of time. Wildstein says Christie was told about the plan two days before the lane closures began during a September 11th memorial service, and that Christie laughed at the idea. In Washington, Congress has passed legislation to avoid a government shutdown only two days before the agencies were expected to run out of money. The measures now keep the federal government funded through December 9th. The package includes $1.1 billion to respond to the Zika virus and $500 million of aid for flooding in Louisiana. 
The White House has authorized a deployment of an additional 600 U.S. troops to Iraq, ahead of the battle to retake Mosul from ISIS. The deployment will increase the total number of U.S. troops in Iraq to more than 5,000. In Somalia, officials say a U.S. airstrike has mistakenly killed more than 20 Somali soldiers. The security minister of Somalia's Gamadug region says the U.S. strikes were requested by officials in a rival region who told the U.S. the strikes were targeting al-Shabaab militants. The Pentagon says it's investigating the incident, but has claimed at least nine al-Shabaab fighters were killed in the strike. In South Carolina, a 14-year-old boy shot and killed his father, then went on a shooting rampage in the playground of the Townville Elementary School in Anderson County, about 100 miles from Atlanta Wednesday. He shot and injured two boys, as well as a teacher, before being arrested. One of the boys who was shot in the leg is in critical condition. The shooter was not named. In South Korea, as many as 40,000 unionized workers staged a one-day strike Thursday to protest the government's attempts to enact legislation tying salaries to productivity rather than seniority. This is one of the union organizers. About 60,000 workers from all over the country went on strike today, and about 50,000 workers joined the rally here. We demand a stop to adopting the illegal wage system based on performance, pushed by the government. It will hurt the people. In news from Mexico, about 1,000 people marched in the town of Iguala to mark the second anniversary of the kidnapping of 43 students from the Atzanapa Teachers College. The students were attacked by local police and subsequently went missing in the southern Mexican state of Guerrero. This is Jose Nava Garcia, a student who survived the attack. We are here to demand justice, because we don't forget. We, as attack survivors of Ayotzinapa, we are constantly aware of our disappeared classmates, because that night, the police were unfortunately waging an all-out war on us, a war without mercy. They waged war on us, and we didn't at this time understand what was happening. We were just freshmen. Meanwhile, in the bordering state of Michoacan, police have arrested at least 47 students from another teacher's college after a confrontation with police clad in riot gear. Police say the students had stolen buses. Some news reports say police fired at the students during the confrontation. On Wednesday, fellow students blocked highways to demand their classmates be released. And in North Dakota, 21 people were arrested Wednesday by police in riot gear while the group was conducting Native American ceremonies to block construction of the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline. The pipeline has faced months of resistance from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and members of hundreds of other tribes from across the U.S., Canada and Latin America. Land defenders say police carrying assault rifles responded to the ceremonies with armored vehicles, tear gas and helicopters. This is Sikangu Lakota grandmother. We had a really nice ceremony, and then we looked, and um, over that way, and the police, there was a few police, and the next thing I knew, there were like 40 police, and they were all dressed in riot gear. We did exactly what we were told to do, except the ones who were in the road, just to tell everybody, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, and I've never in my life seen a gun in real life. And, and, and I've never had a gun pointed at me. And we all went, I went into shock. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Protests continue in the San Diego, California suburb of El Cajon, where police shot and killed an unarmed African-American man Tuesday, after his sister called 911 to report her brother was having a mental health emergency. Eyewitnesses in El Cajon said 38-year-old Alfred Olango was holding his hands up when he was tased by one police officer and then fired on five times by another officer. Olango was a 38-year-old father of two and a Ugandan refugee who moved to the San Diego area 20 years ago. In a dramatic video posted to Facebook, a woman named Rambi Mawewa begins filming moments after Olango is shot dead. In the background, Olango's sister is heard crying over the death of her brother. Okay, so the police did it again, y'all. They shot another unarmed black person, as usual. And the lady is saying she called them for help not to kill her brother, and they shot her brother. 
In the video, Alfred Olongo's grieving sister is seen tearfully confronting police. She tells them, I called you to help me, but you killed my brother. Guys, why couldn't you taste him? Why couldn't you guys taste him? Why, 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 why? What's, what's his birthday so they can find his information? Why couldn't you taste him? I told him he's sick. And you guys shot him. <laughs> The sister of Alfred Alongo can be heard in the video saying, quote, I called three times for them to come help me. Nobody came. They said it's not priority, end quote. Police scanner audio at the time of the shooting reveals officers knew they were responding to a so-called 5150 call or a mental health emergency. It does not appear that officers dispatched a psychiatric emergency response team. El Cajon Police Chief Jeff Davis acknowledged it took officers 50 minutes, that's five zero minutes, to respond to the 911 call of Alango's sister. He said there was no weapon found at the scene of the killing. Chief Davis disputed witness accounts that Alango had his hands in the air, saying the man pointed an object at an officer with both hands as if to fire a handgun. On Wednesday, the male subject paced back and forth while the officers tried to talk to him. At one point, the male rapidly drew an object from his front pants pocket placed both hands together on it and extended it rapidly towards the officer, taking, uh, taking what appeared to be a shooting stance, putting the object in the officer's face. At this time, one of the officers with the taser discharged his taser in an effort to subdue the subject. Simultaneously, the officer uh, who had the object pointed at him uh, discharged his firearm, striking the male. On Wednesday, police confirmed Alfred Olango did not have a gun. The object he pointed at police was a three-inch-long silver e-cigarette. The shooting is just the most recent in a string of police shootings of primarily men of color with mental illness or disability. Just last week, police in Charlotte, North Carolina, shot and killed Keith Scott, a 43-year-old father of seven, who reportedly had suffered a traumatic brain injury during a motorcycle accident in 2015. In July, a police officer in North Miami contends he mistakenly shot an African-American behavioral therapist, Charles Kinsey, when he was aiming for Arnaldo Rios Soto, a 26-year-old autistic man who is simply cradling a toy truck. In addition to concerns over the El Cajon Police Department's response to what was a mental health crisis, questions are being raised about El Cajon Police Officer Richard Gonsalves, who has been identified as the shooter, the officer who fatally shot Alango. Last year, Gonsalves was sued for sexual harassment after making lewd propositions and texting explicit photos, naked photos of his private parts, to his subordinate officer. He was demoted to officer from sergeant. Gonsalves was just served with a second suit in August of this year, after the harassment continued. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. Dan Gillian is the attorney for the family of Alfred Alongo, and also represents Officer Christine Greer, the plaintiff in the sexual harassment lawsuit against Gonsalves. Christopher Rice Wilson is also with us, associate director at Alliance San Diego. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Dan Gillian, let's begin with you. Explain what took place. You are the lawyer for Alfred Alongo's family. How this happened, when the sister called and said her brother was having a mental health emergency. Explain what took place next. Well, you know, there's a lot of facts that uh, we just don't know right now, um, and that's one of the problems that I have with the way that the city of El Cajon and the police department is handling this. Uh, they, there is a video available. They took a still image from that video uh, yesterday and put it out there in the media and began litigating this case in the media. Um, but, you know, selecting the still image that helps them the most. Uh, so I don't have a lot of the facts right now, and I don't feel comfortable saying exactly what happened, because we just don't know. I can tell you this. When the police officers arrived on the scene, they knew that they were arriving in a situation that called for a PERT, a psychiatric emergency response team. Um, they knew that, and they are trained on how to deal with people with mental illness. And one of the things that they know is that people with mental illnesses will act like people with mental illnesses. Um, and the, the sister was clear with them that he was having a mental breakdown. He was having a mental breakdown. He had just lost someone very close to him. 
I do not know the effect of that recent loss um, on any other underlying situation or conditions of his. But they did know it. Even the chief police acknowledged that he was acting erratically and running in out of, out of traffic. So they knew that. Um, and instead of calling the PERT team, which was the, the team that's designed to handle these situations and de escalate these situations, they sent out this Richard Gonzalez, who, in my opinion, based upon the way he's behaved in the past, is a cowboy. He's a cowboy that went out there and took matters into his own hands and, I believe, escalated the situation to the point where this mentally ill person acted like a mentally ill person and raised his hands towards him. We don't know uh, if the officer with the laser deployed that, of taser, deployed that taser first. We just don't know that because we don't have the video. That would be an important thing to know. There was a comment by the chief of police um, that the firing officer, and this would be Richard Gonzalez, that he fired simultaneously. Well, what we talk about in the business when we do police shooting cases is talk about sympathetic fire. And, and the police departments are taught how not to um, have situations like this result in a death as a result of sympathetic fire. And what happens is, oftentimes, when a taser goes off, it loud, creates a loud noise, and other officers who have their weapons drawn will fire. Um, and not, not because any other reason other than they've just now heard another shot. We don't know whether or not the officer who was firing the taser followed protocol, which was to announce loudly, taser, 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 and then fire. We don't know if he did that or not, because they won't release that video. That process of announcing the taser is very important, because it, it helps prevent the sympathetic fire. Again, my role right now is to defend the case that's being litigated in the media by the Alcohol and Police Department is a completely unfair thing to do, that less than 24, hour, 24 hours after this man dies, that the police department is cherry-picking one still image, releasing it to the media, all for the purpose of building their own case, which it boils down to, it was all his own fault. He had it coming. He shouldn't have raised his hands. If he hadn't raised his hands, we, he would be alive. I don't believe that the facts bear that scenario out all that well, but we just don't know yet. We're going to go to break, then come back to this discussion. Dan Gillian is the attorney for Alfred Alongo's family. Alfred Alongo was a Ugandan refugee in El Cajon. A Christopher Rice Wilson, an activist, will talk about the protests that are taking place and what are the demands. And we'll be speaking with John Snook, who is with Treatment Advocacy Center, about mentally ill people and how the police should deal with them. Stay with us. Click loud, go the rhythm of buckshots and bullets alike. The ghetto orchestra is playing tonight, harmonizing at the moment when they take in his life. So fast that he couldn't even put up a fight in his life. No love, sweeping under the rug. The media could give up out another dead thug. They end up, now he's stuck in a puddle of red blood. Mama screaming at the top of her lungs to get up, but little did she know of a baby's ritual. Gunshots of his own matching the enemy decibels. Who would have the bigger testicles? Two go test the foe. Go and let it tool for the festival. Fireworks, them shooting, trying to hurt men. Permanent damage to him for certain. As he lay jerking, no response in his mother's arms. As we write another song about another one. Many, 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 many Protests continue in the San Diego, California suburb of El Cajon, where police shot and killed an unarmed African-American man Tuesday after his sister called 911 to report her brother was having a mental health emergency. After Tuesday's shooting, Alfred Olango's sister explained the encounter with the police. I called the 911 three times to come and help my brother that he's mentally perturbed and he needed help. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would sound somebody to help him and get some crisis communication going on. The police officer, of course, came. He was running around, crossing the street. He almost got hit by the car. So I kind of delegate him with my car and try to get some help so they can take him to the hospital. 
when the police officer came, I told them and they finally got him. I tried to tell my brother, please put your hands up, don't put your hands in your pocket, listen. And I told the police, please don't shoot him, he's sick. I did not call the police officer to come and kill my <laughs> That was Alfred Alongo's sister uh, talking about what happened when her brother was shot. Uh, we're continuing our conversation now with Dan Gillian, the attorney for Olango's family, and Christopher Rice Wilson. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask Christopher Rice Wilson about, uh, could you say something about your response uh, to the shooting? Well, uh, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm simply aghast at the, the actions taken that day by the El Cajon Police Department. Um, and continuing with the police chief's uh, press conference that, uh, you know, revealed a still photo that made their case and presented Alango as a threat. Um, the community is really upset right now, and we, we want justice for Alfred Alango. We want a transparent investigation. Uh, we don't believe that we can get that here in San Diego. Um, and we're asking Attorney General Loretta Lynch to assign a, a, an investigator from the Department of Justice. Um, the community is really upset right now. Um, we are standing with the family, demanding justice, and, and hoping and praying that someone will come help us here in San Diego. Can you talk about the history of police relations in San Diego? Well, I mean— I think police relations with communities of color across this country are not very good right now. We see this happening across the country, so we don't have to isolate it to San Diego. But when you talk about the El Cajon Police Department and its history with the community, um, there was a grand jury report uh, about a year ago that, that recommended improvements in the El Cajon Police Department's handling of the homeless and mentally ill, uh, which have uh, largely gone ignored. Um, there is not a significant black population in El Cajon, and the black folks who do live in El Cajon often feel picked on by the police department, harassed by the police department. Uh, and so when we see what happened the other day to Mr. Alango, it, it's, it did not come as a surprise to many people uh, who said it was just a matter of time prior to this event. Um, Dan Gillian, you not only represent the Alfred Alongo family, after the police shooting death of Alfred Alongo, you represent a plaintiff who sued Officer Gonzalez now twice. And, you know, in civilian life, we see this. We see, for example, in Omar Mateen in the Pulse shooting, the man who opened fire in the nightclub in Florida, um, the violence against women that precedes it. Um, that perhaps is not taken seriously. Can you explain the story of your other plaintiff, uh, the woman officer, who right. says Gonzalez yes. has been harassing her now for how long, and what has he been doing to her? Well, um, I, I represent Officer Christina Greer, and she's a current police officer at the El Cajon Police Department. Now, I am a civil rights attorney, and um, civil rights includes sexual harassment. And, um, and I represent uh, a, a lot of police officers themselves. Uh, and I, you know, I began suing police officers on civil rights cases, and then a number of years ago, they began hiring me uh, to go after the police departments themselves when they've been, their civil rights have been violated. And this is one of those cases where Ms. Greer, uh, Officer Greer, was facing some very severe sexual harassment by her own immediate supervisor, her sergeant. And that was Richard Gonzalez, the same officer now. He was demoted to an officer <clears throat> that shot uh, Mr. Alongo. He sent her uh, um, a graphic lewd photograph of his penis. Um, and it was accompanied by uh, text messages asking her for sexual acts with her wife. She's a lesbian. It was over the top uh, sexual harassment. Uh, something that would get anybody in this world, I would suspect, fired. But for whatever reason, the El Cajon Police Department decided to rally around, circle the wagons around then-Sergeant uh, Richard Gonzalez, and um, just demote him down, and then send him back to work with her, no. at which point he began continuing his harassment of her, spitting on her locker, following her down the hallway, 
other officers would start making comments about her complaint about him because they didn't like that she violated the code of silence. Um, it's just a deplorable situation for Officer Greer. And um, now this cowboy, who felt like he didn't have to follow the rules that said you can't send photographs of your penis to your subordinates, the same officer showed up at the scene of a mentally ill person who was, in, you know, uh, acting out and decided to take this law, the law into his own hands there, too. And um, I think that this is just a problem for the Elkhorn Police Department, because now, as you see again, circling the wagons, rallying yeah. behind this um, now officer and trying to act like he's a victim again. And it's really unfortunate. And um, unfortunately, this is, seems like to me, the state of our uh, affairs when it comes to police departments, even against their own. Uh, I represent a number of officers throughout San Diego County um, in, in, in many civil rights cases where uh, black officers, female officers, are being discriminated against and uh, really harassed at work because either because of their protected class or because they complain about it. And uh, we do have a problem here in San Diego. There's no doubt about that. Well, the details laid out in the lawsuit against Gonzalves are graphic. Part of the complaint addresses the city of El Cajon's lack of action after the harassment took place. It reads, quote, When a sergeant texts his female subordinate a graphic photograph of his penis and offers to be her and her wife's effing buddy, that sergeant should be fired. He should be prosecuted. The city did neither. So, Dan Gillian, can you talk about that and how common a response that is uh, to similar uh, harassment claims? And what the settlement was. I, I've never seen this. I, I've done a lot of sexual harassment cases over the years. I've never seen this. Um, I've never seen—there's only one other occasion where I ever saw an employer send a photograph of himself, and he was not an employer anymore. He was quickly terminated. Uh, this is a case where it really violated the, the, um, the penal code. In other words, he violated criminal law. Um, that's why I was saying he should have been prosecuted. You can't send a photograph of yourself to somebody else um, when they so, don't want it. So, Dan that's Gillian, what was, the, what was the settlement? Well, the settlement the first time, that was handled by another attorney, and they, they uh, entered into a confidential settlement agreement which I don't believe is enforceable. I believe in First Amendment. But at this point, I don't want to violate an agreement that was entered into by another attorney. I took the case for Officer Greer after she returned to work, and they began going after her again um, and harassing her again, and basically trying to punish her for the lawsuit in the first place. She was again, forced was to work with him when she returned? Against her. She was forced to work with him when she returned? Right. I mean, I mean, even yesterday, she, she told me that she was there with him. Um, the other day, she had to uh, show up at another location doing work duties. He was sitting across from her, and she believed that he was videotaping her, just the way he was acting. This guy is over the top. And this, for this police department to be circling the wagons for this cowboy right now is— um, they've done it before, when he did something that should have gotten him terminated. Um, he shouldn't have been a police officer on Tuesday when he shot and killed my client's son. Uh, my client's father, my so, client's brother. Christopher Rice— um, He shouldn't even been a police officer then. Christopher Rice Wilson of Alliance San Diego, what are you demanding now, as the protests continue? We're demanding that the police department release the video. We want to see the video. We don't want a still screenshot that makes their case. We want to see what happened before and after. We want to see uh, Mr. Longo's actions that, that made him a threat. Witnesses, witnesses reported he was holding a vape cigarette before the police department released that information. If witnesses 20 feet away could see it was a vape cigarette, why couldn't the officer see it from five feet away? Well, I also want One to bring into the— One officer tased, the other officer fired a weapon. We want the video. Well, I also want to bring into this conversation John Snook, executive director of the Treatment Advocacy Center. He's co-author of a recent study that found people with mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians. The report is titled, Overlooked in the Undercounted, the Role of Mental Illness in Fatal Law Enforcement Encounters. John Snook, welcome to Democracy Now! So can you talk about what happened to Olango in the context of what your report 
found the way in which police respond uh, to emergency calls having to do with the mentally ill. Sure. This is really the nightmare scenario for families with a loved one who has a mental illness and for law enforcement themselves. These are the sort of situations that we really work every day to prevent. Unfortunately, this seems to have ended in the worst-case scenario. And as we've seen around the country with the data, it happens far too often. And I think one of the things we need to think about is this idea of when someone is having a medical emergency, why are we requiring law enforcement to step in? Why don't we have a mental health system that addresses these folks before these situations happen? And again, we don't want to be in a situation where we're having to say, law enforcement, you need to address this person's needs, because they aren't mental health professionals. They haven't been trained. And San Diego has stepped in with a program that's called PERT. It, it provides basically for a co-responder who is a psychiatric professional to come along on some of these calls. But obviously, that didn't happen in this case, and it can't happen in every case. So we really need to step back and say, how do we keep law enforcement from having to be on the front lines to be our mental health responders and say, how do we get mental health professionals more involved in these cases? What's so frightening here is it sounds like um, Mr. Alongo's sister did everything right. She called up. She said her brother was having a mental health emergency. She called several times. Um, not only did they send the police, but they were, waited 50 minutes. Now, if someone <clears throat> wants to report a mental health emergency, which could save other people, what kind of message is sent when you do this and you simply basically the message is sent if you call to help the mentally ill we will kill you or we will kill them well i think it's important to step back and if you think about mental illness like any other illness and you said this person was having a heart attack let's call the police we wouldn't be surprised that bad outcomes happen because that's simply not what a police officer is there for what we need to do is get away from this situation where we wait until someone is in a crisis before we provide care. I think California has taken some steps, but even as we've been talking about this, there's been a broad discussion in California about misuse of the Prop 63 funds, which are funds that ostensibly were to be provided to mental health. And the Little Hoover Commission just put out a, another report that said, unfortunately, those funds aren't being used for mental health in the way that they should be. The tracking isn't there. And that's what we're talking about, is these situations we have far too many people ending up not getting care until they're in a crisis. And then we wonder why bad outcomes happen. And unfortunately, that's the case ac across the country. We simply have too many people in crisis, law enforcement trying to do their best in the worst case scenarios. And that's when these sort of tragedies occur. We are now talking about, um, according to the figures in mapping police violence, um, <clears throat> Mr. Alongo became the 217th black American to be killed by police so far this year. Ultimately, John Snook, the most important um, recommendation you have at this point, as we see what happened from El Cajon to Tulsa to Charlotte. I think it's quite simple. We have to take mental illness seriously. We did, before uh, this year, we basically weren't even able to really provide a very effective number of how many people with mental illness were killed by law enforcement officers. We know across the country that people with a mental illness are languishing in jails and emergency rooms because we simply don't have enough hospital beds for them. We simply aren't taking mental illness seriously. Finally, we're starting to see some movement. There's a bill on the Hill that's waiting for Senate action that would address these sorts of incidents, these issues with the most severely mentally ill, provide additional funding for police training, provide care for folks before they get to this point. Unfortunately, that's still sitting in Congress. That's the sort of thing that we need done. We need to have people recognize that this is a crisis that our nation is facing, and unless we do more, 
we're going to keep having these sort of incidents John, happen. John Snook, we want to thank you for being with us of the Treatment Advocacy Center, joining us from Washington. Dan Gillian, attorney for the family of Alfred Alongo, the unarmed African-American man who was shot and killed Tuesday by the El Cajon police just outside San Diego. Dan also representing the officer Christine Greer, the plaintiff in a <clears throat> sexual harassment lawsuit against Richard Gonsalves, the officer who killed Mr. Alongo. And thank you so much to Christopher Rice Wilson, associate director at Alliance San Diego. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we're going to talk about Syria. What is taking place there? What needs to be happen? What, what needs to be happening? Back in a minute. <laughs> واحد حبيب الروح يمي واحد حياتي واحد حياتي ودعوني راحوا يمي صوب حمص العادي صوب حمص العادي To Aitit by Youssef Kahia. Aitit is a village in Lebanon. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. The Obama administration is threatening to cut off diplomatic talks with Russia on Syria in the wake of a devastating bombing campaign by the Syrian government and Russia in the city of Aleppo. On Wednesday, the two largest hospitals in East Aleppo were forced to close after being hit by airstrikes. There are reportedly only about 30 doctors left in East Aleppo, where 250,000 people are currently trapped. The Russian-backed bombing of Aleppo intensified after a ceasefire collapsed 10 days ago. Witnesses have described it as the worst assault in the five-year civil war. U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says that the situation in the Syrian set city of Aleppo has become worse than a slaughterhouse. This morning, we awoke to reports of strikes on two more hospitals in Aleppo. Let us be clear, those using ever more destructive weapons know exactly what they are doing. They know they are committing war crimes. Imagine the destruction. People with their limbs blown, blown off, children in a terrible pain with no relief, infected, suffering, dying, with nowhere to go and no end in sight. Imagine a slaughterhouse. This is worse. Even a slaughterhouse is more humane. Hospitals, clinics, ambulances, and medical staff in Aleppo are under attack around the clock. According to Physicians for Human Rights, 95 percent of medical personnel who were in Aleppo before the war have fled, been detained, or killed. This is a war against Syria's health workers. Video footage from Aleppo has emerged showing Syrian civil defense forces digging a young girl out from under the rebel. Five-year-old Ghazal Qasim was reportedly the sole survivor from an airstrike that killed 24 people in the Aleppo neighborhood of Al-Shar. Her entire family, including four siblings, were reportedly killed in the bombing. According to aid groups, children in Aleppo have made up a large proportion of the casualties from the bombings. At least 100,000 children remain trapped in the eastern part of Aleppo. 
Meanwhile, Human Rights Watch has accused Syrian government forces of using toxic chemicals in two recent attacks in Aleppo that killed five civilians and injured dozens. The group also said new information has emerged indicating the self-proclaimed Islamic State, or Daesh, has recently used chemicals as a weapon inside Syria. On Wednesday, President Obama addressed the crisis in Syria during a town hall meeting in CNN. The key in Syria at this point is, unless we can get the parties involved to recognize that they are just burning their country to the ground and get it on a diplomatic and political track, frankly, there's going to be a limit uh, to what we can do. We will try to mitigate the pain and suffering that those folks are, are undergoing. This is part of the reason why our approach to refugees, for example, has to be uh, open-hearted although also hard-headed to protect our homeland. But at the end of the day, uh, there are going to be challenges around the world that happen that don't directly touch on our security, where we need to help, we need to help lead, but just sending in more troops is not going to be the answer. To talk more about Syria, we're joined by Osama Nasser, an activist in East Ghouta, a suburb of Damascus, an area controlled by the opposition forces. Can you tell us what's happening on the ground right now, Osama? Good morning. Uh, actually, uh, you, you know that all the, the, the cameras and all the media is now fixing on Aleppo. Uh, that these cities that are being attacked by the Russian airstrikes and the regime, the Syrian regime forces, uh, stand that the, maybe the the American people and all maybe most of the West know nothing about our cause. They only know that there is, uh, you know, ISIS and there is uh, uh, people who are fighting for some reason or for no reason. Uh, you know that the regime has blocked out all the independent media uh, in here, and he is only the the, the, the only uh, media who who are uh, allowed to go there and there. Uh, actually, people are really up upset about what Mr. Obama said, what Mr. Obama does actually every now and then. Uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, administration did nothing for to stop these ongoing slaughter. In, in Syria, you, and it, it became really complicated year after year, and even day after day. You know that a uh, couple of, uh, you know, today is the first anniversary of the Russian intervention in Syria. Uh, so this means that one year ago, if the U.S. did something about uh, uh, Syria, they they have they had nothing uh, to i mean they were not obliged to to do uh, these marathon in, in negotiations with uh, the russian uh, two years ago there were no for example um, bombing in the european country and in other uh, places rather than syria and iraq three years ago there were even no ss four years ago there there was no, there was no Jabhat al-Nusra. Five years ago, there were only people who are seeking freedom and dignity, and demonstrating very peacefully in the street. So the the more you delay, or the more the the U.S. and the international community uh, uh, are late to to do something to stop this ongoing massacre in Syria, the more it becomes. I'd like to bring in uh, Yasser Munif uh, in, into the conversation, a professor at Emerson College who specializes in grassroots movements in Syria. He's made several trips there, uh, most recently in 2015, when he visited the Syrian-Turkish border. He's a sociology professor at Emerson College. Uh, Yasser, could you talk about why you think the recent ceasefire between, uh, that was negotiated between the U.S. and Russia in Syria collapsed? Thank you for having me. Um, I think the main reason for the collapse of the ceasefire is, um, initially, this, the, the deal between the U.S. and Russia uh, was not political. Uh, it was really only focusing on the military aspect of, uh, of the conflict. 
And um, for the Russian, what was essential and important was basically maintaining the Syrian regime and making sure that um, the boundaries between the uh, jihadist groups and the moderate uh, military groups are blurred, and pushing most of the uh, moderate groups into an alliance with al Qaeda and other jihadist groups. For the uh, for the U.S., uh, the uh, the uh, goal of of that uh, deal was basically to collaborate and coordinate uh, the strikes against ISIS. And in the end, the Syrian uh, opposition or the Syrian population didn't get anything. Uh, and um, the, the, the deal was uh, basically offering to the uh, Russian um, that they could maintain uh, the, uh, the uh, Syrian despot. So uh, there was total refusal and rejection of, of the deal by the Syrian population, uh, for obvious reasons. And it was basically reducing their revolution into a humanitarian um, conflict uh, that would basically uh, lead to opening few corridors here and there, and uh, that some of the aid would reach uh, the besieged areas in, in Aleppo and, and so on. Uh, but in the end, it was really benefiting the Syrian regime, not uh, any of the opposition. And despite well, I that— I want to turn, Yasser, I want to turn to comments made by the U.N. Special Envoy for Syria, Stefan de Mistura. In an interview with Al Jazeera's Mehdi Hassan on Saturday, he explained why he thought the recent Syrian ceasefire collapsed. Who do you think would not agree, would not agree with uh, the fact that uh, a, the Syrian air force needs to be grounded? Well, obviously, President Assad is clearly not happy about it. Otherwise, he would have been not able to do what he's been claiming publicly to do in Daraya and elsewhere, to reconquer the whole Syria territory. And to do so, he needs the Air Force. On the other side, put yourself in the place of the armed opposition and their sponsors. Do they really find it easy for them, or do they like the idea of disconnecting from al-Nusra, which, in their view, has been one of the biggest fighters against Assad, but at the same time, everybody recognizes, including UN, is al-Qaeda, regardless whether they change the name. Then you would have an answer, who has no, at the moment, keen interest in making the deal working. Yasser Munif, can you comment on what the U.N. envoy for Syria said, and in particular the point he makes about uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and their working with opposition forces in Syria? The level and the scale of the violence against the Syrian population in Syria is basically due, it's because of uh, the uh, monumental resilience and resistance of the Syrian population. Um, we have to remember that the Syrian revolution has been going for five years, and it has many, many uh, enemies, including the U.S. and Russia and uh, uh, Iran and Hezbollah and Turkey and uh, Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth. And all these different forces, for different reasons, are trying to crush the Syrian revolution. Uh, the Syrian regime has been, since the beginning, trying to crush the secular and the progressive dimension of the revolution, and pushed the jihadists uh, and empowered them and released them from, from prison, and they have become what they are today. And um, the Russian uh, also uh, are trying to basically uh, break that kind of uh, difference or differentiation between the moderate and the secular, to a certain extent, and the jihadist uh, groups. And uh, by using that type of violence uh, and massacring the population, slaughtering people in, in Aleppo, it's pushing the moderate groups and uh, al-Qaeda to basically uh, form an alliance and, as such, uh, pushing the West to basically choose the lesser evil, and that lesser evil being uh, the Syrian regime, as opposed to al-Qaeda and, and ISIS. Uh, and even the UN played a very detrimental role in the Syrian conflict. I mean, the reports that show how uh, the, the, uh, the UN has been helping and uh, dropping aid to uh, the besieged um, city of Deir ez-Zor, which is under the control of the Syrian regime, but never dropping aid to any of uh, the areas controlled by the opposition, or uh, some of the funding that reached the Syrian military that was sent by the UN and, and so on. So the role of the UN is really detrimental. The Mustura is basically and uh, clearly biased uh, toward the Syrian regime. I wanted to ask you about a comment that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said in an interview last week on AP, uh, the Syrian president denying government forces are besieging the rebel-held area. 
areas of Aleppo. If there's a really siege or siege around the city of Aleppo, people would have been dead by now. This is for a second, more importantly, they've been shelling the neighboring areas and the position of the Syrian army for years, non-stop non -stop shelling of mortars and different kind of uh, lethal bombs. Uh, how could they be starving while at the same time they can have armaments? How can we prevent the foods and the medical aid from reaching that area and we cannot stop the armament from reaching that area? They accuse Syria of attacking hospitals. So you have hospitals and you have doctors and you have everything. How could you have them? Uh, how could you have armament? That's the question. How can you get armament to your people if you claim that you have people and grassroots while you don't have food? They have to explain. I don't have to explain. The reality is telling. That's the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad. Um, Yasser Manif, can you respond? So, uh, the Syrian regime very early uh, understood the importance of the media and creating a discourse uh, in addition to what's happening on the ground, the military aspect of, of the conflict. And it was able, unfortunately, to create a parallel reality and uh, create a media apparatus uh, and uh, information propaganda that is relayed by a number of different uh, networks, including RT, the Russian TV, but also uh, a number of different uh, w websites and uh, news outlets here in the U.S., for example, um, Mint Media and uh, Counterpunch and others who are basically uh, repeating such silly things. I mean, anyone can verify and see that there is a siege around Aleppo. It's not very difficult to do. Uh, if journalists wanted really to talk to people on the ground and interview them and get their, uh, their views, uh, it would be very easy. But the Syrian regime basically understands that uh, and is using the media and that type of discourse as a weapon against uh, the revolution, uh, basically trying to uh, confuse uh, the, the uh, different uh, uh, audiences and telling them that there are different truths, there are biases, we're not sure, basically uh, creating confusion and, uh, and challenging um, what's happening on the ground. Well, today, The Intercept uh, obtained, uh, yesterday, uh, obtained internal U.N. emails that revealed also that U.S. and European sanctions are having an extremely detrimental effect on ordinary Syrians and making uh, access uh, to aid supplies uh, more difficult. Uh, Yasser Munif, could you respond to that? Sure. Um, I mean, this is also uh, another aspect. The Syrian regime is using all weapons that are available um, for, for it to, to use, including um, besieging uh, entire areas, uh, uh, starving the population, uh, using uh, uh, bunker busters uh, bombs with the, with the aid of the, the, the Russian, uh, torturing the population, uh, preventing water from reaching certain areas, and, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, I mean, the sanctions, as we know from previous experience with Iraq and, and so on, uh, affect for the most part uh, the, the civilian population. Uh, and that's another example of, uh, of how uh, the, the, uh, the Syrian population is basically uh, um, surrounded and besieged in, in so many different ways. I also wanted to mention that, um, as uh, your previous guest um, uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, today we are uh, uh, witnessing or celebrating the first uh, anniversary of um, uh, the, the uh, Russian intervention. And uh, we are organizing a number of revolt in more than 30 uh, different cities around the world on October 1st. Uh, to basically raise awareness and uh, tell, pe tell people what's happening. There will be re uh, revolts, protests, rallies, sit-ins, uh, to basically try to break the siege around the Syrian revolution and tell people that uh, the narrative that he they're hearing about the, uh, the uh, civilian war and uh, intervention and so on are uh, part of what is happening. The other part is uh, the resilience of the Syrian population, its resistance, and the ongoing Syrian revolution with its creative uh, dimension and what people are doing within um, different, uh, in, in myriad different ways. Yasser Munif, we want to thank you for being with us, Syrian scholar, professor at Emerson College in Boston, and Osama Nasser speaking to us from East Ghouta, Syria. We're going to continue this conversation and post it online at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our website is democracynow.org.